going on everybody it's Roar Wider coming at you with a brand new video and Yu-Gi-Oh is currently on fire right now in a literal sense given the sudden surge of popularity of Snake Eyes and Fire King after the release of Phantom Nightmare. This set of course released powerful cards like Snake Eyes Poplar as well as Promethean Princess which absolutely surged fire decks especially the pure and fire king variants of Snake Eye to complete dominance at the top level. We're currently seeing turnover rates of about 85% of top cut being decks like Snake Eyes and Fire King at the most recent YCS Vegas. Granted, this is a team YCS, and so that does affect the deck building process just a little bit, but it's still kind of crazy to think about that, especially given that between that and the last event, I believe it was the UDS, it seems like we're currently at a tier zero representation. Because of this, a lot of people are really worried, not because Snake Eyes Fire King is like particularly annoying or like super obnoxious to play against, it's mainly the fact that it's a fun deck, but it's very high priced compared to any other deck in the format right now. With the wanted engine and stuff and all of those other cards going upwards of like a thousand dollars for a whole deck is just absolutely ridiculous and that's probably the main reason why these decks are so hated i don't think it's all doom and gloom though i think there's definitely still a good handful of decks that you can take to events and see success with even if it's overwhelmed by the massive wave of fire king snake eyes whatever decks with that being said let's go ahead and get right into my competitive Yu -Gi Oh tier list for the march 2024 format starting off of course is the fire king and snake eyes decks both of which basically being undisputed tier one uh, it doesn't really matter too much but i guess the fire king one you can put a little bit above the like pure snake eyes variants because those are more popular as well as seeing more topping results but i think that this deck or at least just the snake eyes deck period is just so absurdly strong probably one of the strongest archetypes we've seen in recent Yu-Gi-Oh! with many upon many different one card combos the ability to play through multiple disruptions and still keep going as well as having some of the most insane follow-up of any deck ever printed it basically makes snake eyes a deck where if you're going second you're in for a super rough time because it seems like almost no amount of hand traps except for exactly nibiru will be enough to stop them not to mention even if you break the board you still have to worry if you don't kill them because their recursion on the next turn is out of this world. Even when you go first, it seems like a lot of end boards aren't really able to keep up with just how much Snake Eyes can keep playing, with the Dia Bellstar engine as well as cards like Bonfire allowing them to dig through their deck for a lot of extension. The Fire King engine only adds to that fire, I guess I should say, by being an extra wave of power through the deck that you can use for additional pops and disruptions as well as even more grind game and more ability to play through hand traps with cards like Fire King Kirin. I don't think anyone doubts that these are the absolute best decks in the game right now, so much so that some people are even asking for an emergency ban list which is wild. We'll have to see how it shapes up starting from YCS's from now on though after the team YCS, so we'll probably see a little bit of less like representation as people actually try to like play more creative or fun decks, but I still think this this is going to be by far the most dominant deck in the coming formats. Coming up next, we have Branded, and Branded's actually going to be going at the very top of the Tier 2 category. Now, Branded is shockingly in a super good spot right now. We're seeing cards like Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring outside of the Snake Eyes decks being used a lot less, at least in the main deck, because of how bad it is to use against Fire King Snake Eyes if they start going off with two bodies on board. Because as we all know, putting an Ash in your grave means it's prime fuel for Hita to steal it, go into Promethean Princess, summon something back, keep comboing and go into like Whale or maybe even full combo depending on the rest of their hand. That means your branded fusion can resolve much more safely. Not to mention the deck has a lot of other things going for this format. Cards like Branded Opening provide amazing protection for your fusions this format due to all the popping going on with the Fire King and Snake Eyes engines. Mirror Jade is not only really good at getting rid of threats with Banishing, which also gets you follow-up as well, and its follow-up is really good in general, especially able to keep up with Snake Eyes as a whole, but also Mirror Jade being able to float on destruction during the end phase, and Snake Eyes can't really do too much about it. I mean, they do have things that trigger when stuff is popped, but it's not really enough to like come back from the Mirror Jade nuking the board. 
Combine this with a lot of cards being able to bait multiple layers of interaction, such as Cartesia stopping things like Imperm, Quem being a good target to eat hand traps, as well as using cards like Branded Lost to dodge things like Ghost Bell, and the fact that the gimmick puppet lock is still a thing and Bist deals aren't really so much prominent in the format anymore, the deck feels very, very strong, and the only reason I don't put it in tier 1.5 is because currently the turnover rate isn't too amazing, but I can definitely see if a lot of higher level players actually hop on this deck, I could easily see it taking up a good chunk of top spots in coming events. Next on the list is Fluanderies, and Flu is basically in a decent spot because Dimension Shifter is such a powerful card, not to mention, as we've seen from feature matches, Harpy's Feather Storm is still a card that definitely needs to go, it is so absurdly strong. We combine this with the fact that Imperm isn't really so strong in this format uh, because of cards like Kieran, and just things like that in general. The deck can play through Disruptions a lot easier, as well as having the big Floodgate makes your opponent have a lot harder of a time of actually outing your board because they want to put their things in defense and can't really go for link plays. Speaking of shifter decks, I actually wanted to talk a bit about Exosister. So I think Exosister, that's probably the one tier list you'll ever hear me say this, I think Exosister is actually pretty solid right now. I usually say this deck is just like the worst of the shifter decks, well not Vanquish, so it kind of takes that spot, and that it doesn't really do too much for its end board, but I think right now it's actually enough for a lot of different reasons. Of course Dimension Shifter is a really big factor in carrying the deck, but it also has access to a few one card combos, mainly like with the Martha and stuff, as well as extension with the Sakitama Aratama engines. But think about the fact that we're in a very graveyard heavy format right now with the Snake Eyes and Fire King strategies, meaning cards like your walking Abyss Dweller, well Abyss Dweller is already walking so your archetypal Abyss Dweller, I guess, is the more uh, correct term. As well as cards being able to banish instead of putting in Grave for them to get effects later on, feels really, really strong against those strategies. The only thing I have to say that'll make Exosister, other than representation, not really see as much top uh, success is mainly the relevance of cards like Super Poly. Super Poly is a really strong card this format, which I should have mentioned in the branded section as well, but it's just going to absolutely wipe any Exosister player that tries to go second against any deck that has it one face down, not to mention with the sheer popularity of good decks like Ubel as well. And it's going to be very, very difficult for Exosister to go second. Going first though, I think that they can set up a pretty strong board, even through different hand traps, especially because Ash isn't as prominent. A deck I really wanted to talk about on this list is a Kastra. Uh, Kastra is probably one of the best decks you can play, mainly as one of those meta killer decks, like anti-meta decks. Like, funnily enough, that's actually kind of what it was on first release, but now it's actually a good deck that happens to be anti-meta. The big thing about Kastra is, of course, Dimension Shifter, uh, which is going to be seen a lot in this uh, tier list, but it actually has a lot of other things going for it as well. Your Kastra monsters are very, very large, meaning that they can't really be outed super easily with cards in the main deck for Snake Eyes, other than exactly like Garunix and Diabell Star, which can't even really out Unicorn. Shangri Era having protection is also very, very strong because of all the popping this format. And though the zone blocking isn't going to be as prominent as it used to be, it can definitely make a lot of players have to think a little bit harder if they're comboing, because having one or two zones locked off can actually be really difficult for a combo deck to play. You aren't super prone to your stuff being popped because they don't really trigger on summon and their inherent summons are not once per turn. So all you have to do is have like a couple of Kastras in hand and a lot of disruptions can be baited, especially with powerful cards cards like Fender, they kind of just have to be outed immediately, otherwise they will be a very intimidating threat. But even if they do get popped, Castra Birth is an insane card, seriously. Like if a Snake Eyes player activates like original Sinful Spoils, you can just wipe their whole graveyard, which is ridiculous. Speaking of graveyard, you have cards like Harmonizer Gradiel that can actually interrupt the graveyard significantly. And even for time purposes, you can make Flare Metal Dragon, which is a very strong card as well, especially because it has protection. Because of the different types and attributes, it also doesn't fall super hard victim to cards like Super Poly, and a lot of hand traps don't really affect it as much, because even if you do stop them from like comboing, so to speak, they can still end on the Shangri Era and summon stuff from deck, or even just sitting on the Castra bodies alone can be enough sometimes with some hand traps. I think overall, even though a Rise Heart is gone, Castra is in a very solid spot, and it's probably going to be the third or fourth best deck in the format right now. 
Next on our list is Unchained, and I think that Unchained is still a very solid deck. It has a lot of things going for it, with Caesar being a very powerful card. The ability to play under Nib sometimes is really cool, and it has the option of playing either really explosively or really conservatively for cards like Nib. The varying attributes makes it a lot harder to hit with cards like Super Poly as well, and it can play through a few hand traps moderately fine, with cards like Tour Guide being able to eat a lot of them. I think the deck mainly just phased out a lot of representation, especially because Sharvara dodging Imperm was really important, but Imperm isn't really as prominent now because of cards like Kieran anyway, so I think you can get away with a lot of shenanigans as an Unchained player, especially because of all the popping going on, meaning that their opponent will have to choose very, very carefully what they want to pop with cards like Princess, for example, but if they try to wait a little bit too long, you can punish them hard with certain cards like SP. I think it's definitely going to lack a little bit in representation, but as always, I still think that Unchained is a very powerful deck. Now, Labyrinth I'm a little bit iffy about because I did really hype this deck up significantly, but then when you look at the turnover rate at events like the YCS 3v3, it didn't really see any representation like Top 16, for example, at all, but it has seen some success at some smaller tier events. I think it has a lot going for it, it has a really strong matchup against Castra, for example, and it can bully a lot of lower tier decks, but it does get punished a little bit by cards like Shifter, as well as cards like Ghost Spell just being so prominent, especially if you don't open Rollback, it's going to hurt a lot. Not to mention, the deck is still very prone to bricking, as well as getting blown out by cards like Feather Duster and Lightning Storm, and to be fair, those cards are seeing a lot less play due to cards like Cosmic being better for Anti-Spell, which Anti-Spell is very good in this deck, but that means that your big welcomes are probably going to get banished, meaning you can't take advantage of the graveyard effects, which can be very unfortunate. I'm tempted to put it in tier 1.5 at the very bottom. I think it is a very solid deck, especially in the hands of the right pilot. It is a very complicated deck, so a lot of people don't really play it or play it properly. Like, this is probably one of the most, if not the most difficult decks I've ever played in this game. But I think that in the hands of the right player, it can absolutely dominate, especially depending on the build. You just really have to watch out for Super Poly. I swear to God, I've gotten hit with Super Poly in this deck more than any other deck. Next on our list is Monodium, and Monodium I'm also a little torn on because it didn't really see very much success here either, but I think it's still a very strong deck. It has a pretty decent matchup against Snake Eyes Fire King because similar to those decks, it actually has a lot of playability through disruptions most of the time, except for exactly Droll. But the problem is Droll and also cards like Nib are seeing a lot of play right now because of those decks, so it ends up making it a lot more risky to actually pilot this deck. I think in game 1s and also lower tier events, it can absolutely slaughter. You can go to lower tier events like a regional or something and just completely dominate with this deck, but I think when you go to an event like a YCS, it might be a better bet to just take the money you invested in Monodium and put it into a different deck such as Castra or one of the top decks. It's really cool because cards like Dark Ruler aren't really a thing right now, so even if you don't get access to the counter trap off of Rumheart or your uh, Visus Armatara, it's not really a big deal, but it's definitely like a player preference choice to build as opposed to like a one of the top decks you gotta play build. Next up we have Ubel, and I actually am very shocked at the massive influx in Ubel players and actual tops at lower tier events. When looking at Ubel as like a pure deck, it's not really great at all. But when you combine it into like this fiend unchained mashup kind of pile that's seeing a lot of success in the OCG, but a lot of play over here as well, that only gets better after Legacy of Destruction and the promo hits us, the Phantom of Ubel, this deck actually becomes really, really great. I'm gonna put it at the very, very top of Rogue, because I think that especially once a lot of pro players start getting their hands on this deck, it can do a lot of things in a format, especially when people aren't really reading the Ubel cards. The main issue right now is that even though it does have advantage such as like the element of surprise, super poly being good, and having possibly the best super poly target in the entire game, people are preparing for it by getting that said super poly target for that deck. If they have the space for super poly like voiceless or something, they can just slam it in the extra deck and then punish any Ubel player. But also it tends to brick a lot now uh, because they don't have access to the new uh, throne. I think it's called Nightmare Throne coming out of Legacy Destruction just yet, as well as the new level four monster, I think it is. I know it's a new main deck monster. Uh, both of those cards significantly increase the consistency of the deck, especially the pile version, as well as the ability to play through disruptions. As it stands though, it can end up being a little bit clunky and that can end up punishing you a lot. Not to mention, it gets hurt a lot by cards like Ash or Imperm and just has a hard time playing through hand traps, period. Again, I think if a pro player gets their hands on this, it can be really deadly, but I think until Legacy of Destruction comes out for the average player, it's going to be at the top end of Rogue. Next up we have Purely, and I think Purely is decent as a deck. 
I'll probably put it above Unchained here, uh, because it did see a top at Vegas, which was a little bit shocking to me that someone would play that on the 3v3. But I mean, Purely is an alright deck. I mean, it does get hard punished by Anti-Spell, which is really, really prominent by now. Not to mention that if you play against a Goblin player, I mean, it's just so over. Uh, but other than that, I mean, sitting on a Towers is really, really great. It's why another deck we're about to talk about is also pretty strong right now. Uh, a lot of decks, especially Snake Eyes, just kind of can't really out it unless they play Underworld Goddess. But also the fact that a lot of their removal doesn't destroy is pretty great as well. And they have some built-in archetypal OTKs with the uh, Purely Happiness. Or is it just Purely? No, it's E Purely Happiness. And X Purely is the really big one. I think overall, it's just a so-so deck that you can absolutely steal some wins with. All right, all right. We're going to talk about Voiceless now. So Voiceless actually saw the third highest, second highest if you count Fire King and Snake Eyes being the same thing, uh, tops at Vegas, but holy shit, did this deck end up disappointing overall in terms of especially like feature matches and stuff. A lot of Voiceless players don't seem to know how to pilot the deck properly, I mean shit, one of the written features literally had someone cheating by dumping an illegal target off of a Diviner. And the deck also seems to brick a lot, not to mention being easily stopped by cards like Droll. However, the deck is still highly represented. I don't know why this deck is just super popular. Maybe because it's like the second cheapest meta option after Snake Eyes if you don't want to play cash. And also they get the ability to play cards like Super Poly really, really well because they don't care about their extra deck. But I think the thing that interests me the most is like the branded variants of the Voiceless strategy. I think it's really, really cool. You get access to the really good cards like Quem and Cartesia and Sanctifier for the Puppet Lock and everything. You can do a lot of really neat stuff and play through a lot of hand traps or bait a lot of hand traps. I think that mainly because of representation, the deck is still going to be in 1.5. I'm going to put on the lower end though, because I think it will take a little bit of a dip, especially after seeing how it did uh, in terms of, like feature matches and stuff. Do I think the price of low is justified? No, not really, even though it's mainly that high because the only like good secret out of the set. But this deck is very, very popular and we'll probably keep seeing it for a very long time. Next up is a deck that I think I missed on my last tier list, and I do apologize for that, and that is Raid Raptor, and this deck is actually seeing a lot of discussion. Like, I keep getting so many people bringing up Raid Raptor in, like, certain talks about the meta, and also being like, oh, there's a really strong rogue contender, really, really great. Even Jesse Cotton is uh, talking about it, and I think that's pretty interesting. And the thing that the Raid Raptor really does is that they have a lot of starters and extenders now that get them access to, like, I think it's three towers, which is really, really huge. Not to mention you have cards like Ultimate Falcon that I think in, like, skill drains all of your opponent's monsters and then burns the opponent. I think that the Rising Rebellion Falcon here, like, nukes the board. There's a lot of stuff that Raid Raptor actually has going for it. To be fair, other than that, though, my knowledge on this deck is a little bit limited. I think it does get hit hard by cards like Droll and also uh, Nibiru and stuff like that, but feel free to let me know in the comments if that is true or not. But I'm interested to see how this deck plays out because it's getting a lot of discussion in the community, and I really want to see what happens. Next up we have Rescue Ace, and I think Rescue Ace has some really good legs to stand on in this format. Being a fire deck, of course, means it naturally has access to a lot of the really powerful fire engines such as Fire King, Snake Eyes, anything like that. And they of course have access to things like Princess and Amblo Well, meaning that they can make an actually stronger end board on top of their set four off of their turbulence, which, uh, by the way, did I mention already that Imperm isn't seeing as much play this format? It's got a very solid grind game with cards like Emergency as well as Rescue Ace HQ, and it did actually see a top at the Vegas 3v3. I think their Rescue Ace is actually also being played as a sort of budget fire deck as opposed to Snake Eye uh, Fire King variants and themselves, and I think that's really, really cool, and I think the deck is definitely very solid. Coming up next, we have Runic variants, and this can apply to a few different things, especially because we are going to talk about Sprite, so this is mostly going to be applying to like the runic synchro variants with like the bestials and stuff like that uh, we can talk more about like the live twin stuff in the sprite section uh, so when it comes to like bestial synchro i think it's actually pretty solid unfortunately the bestials aren't like super powerful right now of course because fire is everywhere and stuff uh, but it can definitely hit certain things like low in the voiceless matchup and a lot of cards actually in the voiceless matchup giving it a really good time there also pretty solid against decks like labyrinth but at the end of the day you can always just banish your own stuff but i think the really cool thing comes with the ability to bait hand traps other than you know droll which is very very strong against it as well as making powerful toolbox cards like chaos angel and especially 
especially Chengying, which is an absolutely nutty card right now in the Fire format. It's probably the best Runic variant you can play, even though there are a lot of other things you can play, such as Runic Earthbound and Runic Goaty and Runic Earthbound Goaty, and wow, people really like mixing all those three archetypes together. I actually think representation-wise, I'll probably put it below Ubel and Raid Raptor, especially because Raid Raptor is actually apparently seeing consistent tops. But I think that this deck is pretty solid, and I think the same goes for sprite variants as well. Even like ignoring things like Melfi and stuff like that, which is actually kind of decent right now. We are seeing things, of course, like Live Twin Runic Sprite, which is, of course, what I'm playing at my regional, which is going to be really, really fun. They're actually fairly solid, especially because the sprites are just such amazing extenders going into this format. Uh, if you normal summon something, for example, to special a sprite, your opponent can't princess you until you summon that sprite monster. And once you summon that sprite, you still get a lot of advantage off things like Jet and then Starter and then Red, Carrot, etc. And the engines are usually fairly compact, so even if you're not playing like a runic engine, which I still think the runic variants of sprite are still the best, you can just fit so many hand traps in, which is awesome. Mainly, you have to watch out for things hitting your gigantic, or if you have to go for an improvised line, you have to watch out for Nibiru, but overall I think the sprite builds are also pretty damn good. Next up we have Plant. I haven't seen Plant doing anything, not gonna lie. Like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I just really haven't seen too much from it. Still haven't seen exactly what it does with all of the new aroma stuff coming out of, or not coming out, but that came out of Phantom Nightmare, but I am more than happy to be proven wrong in the future. Next up we have Tier Limit, and I think that it's an interesting format for Tier. Uh, you have too many shifter decks running around, in my opinion, to, like, actually viably play the deck. Not to mention a lot of graveyard hate, a lot of decks are fitting in Abyss Dweller when they can. So it just doesn't really have a great matchup against a lot of things. Not to mention that Snake Eyes is currently what it was in its prime. So it kind of struggles in terms of putting up as, an, uh, as many disruptions, or enough disruptions, or being able to play through all those disruptions, as well as grind properly. And then finally, we have Vanquish Soul, which, definitely the worst of the shifter decks. I think the deck itself is fine right but right now it just does not feel great in a very hand trap heavy format uh you're gonna get hit so much on your raisin on your stake your soul on your uh, link monster trying to get something back from grave there's just going to be so much going against you that if you really want to play a shifter deck, you'd honestly be better off just playing Kashtara. Well, everybody, that's going to do it for my tier list for March 2024. A lot of these were a bit hard to rank, especially in the rogue category, which almost all seemed like they came at once. Sorry about that. I didn't actually intend for that to happen. But I think at least in terms of the tier 1 and 1.5 decks, a lot of it is very, very clear, especially when it comes to Snake Eyes, uh, Fire King, etc., as well as Kashtara. I think Voiceless is like going to just be a represented enough to have a okay turnover rate regardless but i'm really interested to see how a lot of these tier 2 decks go as well as the rogue contenders like raid raptor and ubel but that's just my opinion let me know your side in the comments below because that's gonna do it for the video if you like it please sure to leave a like as helps put this video and the channel into youtube recommended and if this content was more like it like the rest of my tier list then perhaps consider subscribing and turning on notifications because support the channel more than anything else and it's absolutely free plus we're trying to hit 10,000 subscribers by the end of 2024 also it is probably directly while getting some awesome teaching merchandise in the process check out tapio cards in the link down below use code aurora5 for 5% off your purchase at checkout and support me financially. Once again, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. This is Aurora, signing off. Stop.